water. Yes, water. I'd like you to raise your hand today if you use water. <laughs> maybe we brushed our teeth with it, maybe we even cooked with it. Our kids play with it. <laughs> maybe your dog takes a bath in it. Our earth is primarily all water. In fact, 75% of our earth is solely water. So we all need it, right? Because looked around the room, you saw all the hands go up. So what if someone presented a scenario to you and said that you can no longer drink your water? Or that your water was toxic? What would you do? This issue became a reality in 2014 in Toledo, Ohio, where we're all at right now. So our drinking water was infected by a toxin, by an algae. And the picture that you're seeing is a satellite image of what our lake, one of our great lakes, looked like from space. This is a satellite image. Our problem is so huge that you can see it around the world. And other people can see that green, nasty slime. That's the algae right there. And your water right there, that clean glass of water that you have every morning, actually is filled with algae. It's all green. And that's bad. I, mean, I don't know about you, but that scares me. Does that scare everybody else? Yep. So algal blooms, eutrophication. There's a problem that we have here in Toledo with that. So the picture you're looking at is what algae looks like at the microscopic level, looking through a microscope. So they're really tiny, but they can have the potential to cause a huge issue. So we get the picture. They're bad. So how exactly does algae form? What are all the nutrients that we have in algae? What is in our water exactly? Well, there's three main nutrients we're going to talk about. First is carbon. Carbon, the backbone of life. We all have it, we all need it. And then there's nitrogen. Nitrogen is also found in our ecosystem. And again, we need it. But the third one, that phosphorus, you hear that a lot. That gets thrown around a lot because it's a problem. So we have phosphorus. We have phosphorus everywhere. But this is what happens when we have too much phosphorus. You see that algae again, that green, thick algae? Someone is holding that in their hands because there is such a problem with it that you can actually scoop it up. Our beaches are filled with it. Our water, all of Lake Erie is filled with it. So we get the picture that phosphorus is bad. But where exactly is this huge problem? You know, where, where is it coming from? So I want to be really careful when I talk about this because it's not just one person, one party, one group of people that's contributing to this issue. There is phosphorus that we have in a lot of different products. We used to have it in our detergents. Now we have it in agriculture. But collectively, we use phosphorus a lot. And right now, we have too much phosphorus in our water. So the first one, agriculture. Agricultural fertilizer. Every fertilizer that we have usually contains phosphorus and nitrogen. So the picture you see below is what a field looks like. So farmers have these large fields out, and they put phosphorus, which is in our fertilizer, on our fields. Secondly, you can also have it in home fertilizers, maybe even a home usage somehow. We're having fertilizer there, which contains phosphorus, which again, is bad. And these two combinations together with climate and weather can cause a problem. So say we're out in Lake Erie, and we have a weather pattern where for three days we have no wind, no turbulence, nothing to mix up our water. Well, that can create an environment where our algae that's sitting in our water can take up the phosphorus and then grow and thrive. And it kind of creates that green sheet of algae that you can see from space then, that problem. So the second picture you're looking at specifically focuses on Toledo and the Maumee River. So again, satellite image that you can see, a bunch of green algae, and that's a problem. So I have highlighted right here the Maumee River. So that is the largest tributary river to Lake Erie which means it's where all the water is coming into and is mainly all flowing into Lake Erie. Here's the thing about that tributary. 80% of that tributary comes from agricultural water. So that's runoff. Runoff, you might hear that word thrown around a lot. So we have a giant rain event where all this phosphorus and fertilizer that we put on our lawns, say our agricultural fields, all the water hits it and then it flows off into our drinking water supply, which goes down the Maumee River into Lake Erie. So that's an issue because we have so much agricultural land and so much fertilizers that can create an algal bloom. And this is a huge issue. 
A lot of people think that maybe it's just a mommy issue. Maybe it's just a Toledo issue. Maybe it is just an Ohio issue, but it's not. It's huge. So the first picture we have up there is of the Baltic Sea. So the Baltic Sea, just like Lake Erie, experiences this same occurrence every year. But every late summer, we have lots of algae over in the Baltic Sea. And again, it's caused from agricultural fertilizers. We have too much phosphorus. And that second picture looks at microcystis. Microcystis is what was the main algae that was found in our drinking water supply in 2014. So microcystis is an algae that has the ability to cause a lot of damage. It can kill you if you drink it. It's a hepatotoxin, like a neurotoxin. It can affect your livers, your kidneys, and can cause a lot of damage to humans, maybe even pets or livestock, and that's an issue. So what we're looking at is a diagram that shows where all the microcystis is in just the United States. And again, this is a global issue. So we can see, I have highlighted Toledo to show you that we have concentrations both low and high in Ohio, which is around, again, Lake Erie, but more water systems than just Lake Erie. So wouldn't it be great if we could just simply take all the phosphorus out of our water? So the obvious solution to maybe like the algal blooms is just can't we just limit our phosphorus? Can't we just take all that out so we don't have that? Well, it's not always that simple because, again, we use it in agriculture. We use it in lots of different products. And to limit it, we might cause a problem. We have policies in place already. Our farmers need it. We need it. So it's not always easy to just remove the phosphorus. So again, we're looking at, from 2014, the Toledo Water Emergency, a giant satellite image to demonstrate how big this issue is. Now, what if I presented another scenario to you and told you you could look at something so small, so tiny, that you need a microscope to look at it, but it has the potential to really help clean up our drinking water supply. So what we're looking at right now is a bacterium, and this bacterium is magnetic. When people hear the word bacteria, they get a little, little nervous, they get a little scared, because they think bacteria is bad. They think, oh no, bacteria causes our diseases, they can be in our ecosystems, they can be in our bodies. But actually, lots of bacteria that we have in our bodies and our ecosystem are beneficial to you, and they are helpful. So this is a magnetic bacterium. That tiny circle that you see inside the bacterium, those little tiny circles are magnets. And they're called magnosomes. So it's so tiny that they can move magnetically. So it's called magnetotactic bacteria. And I know that's a mouthful, so maybe we should say it slowly together. Uh, mag. Net, O, tact, tick. Magnetotactic. There we go. <laughs> uh, bacteria. So there's three important components to this bacteria that has the potential to really clean up a drinking water supply. Well, how? First, they are magnetic. Again, just like the name suggests, you can move them with a magnet. They have a north and a south end, just like any magnet you see. And you can move them very easily in any water ecosystem. Secondly, they are found everywhere, and I mean everywhere. You can find them in the Maumee River, Lake Erie, any other place around the world. Likely in any ecosystem that has water, you'll find them in the water ecosystem because that's where they live. And thirdly, which is so crucial and a really cool part of this bacteria, is they have the ability to store phosphorus. They're like a sponge that can take phosphorus out of a water environment. They can actually absorb it from the water. And why should we care about that? Because we have too much phosphorus. So what we're looking at, uh, the first picture we're going to look at uh, shows up is a zoomed up image of this bacteria. So again, you see those tiny circles, those magnets? Again, magnosomes, how the bacteria moves. Secondly, that giant circle, that gray circle, that's a phosphorus inclusion. That's where all the phosphorus and all those nutrients get absorbed to inside the bacteria. And the tail is how the bacteria propels itself forward in the water. It's how it moves. And the other picture we're going to look at is of a jar. Say you collect a water sample. You could go, let's go to Lake Erie and say we're going to pick up a jar of water. We're going to collect half sediment and half water. So these bacteria, they live in the sediment. They like the sediment. And you can have a magnet on the side of any jar that you've collected, and you can actually extract them from the water. They like the magnets. They'll move towards the magnets. You can take them out right next to the magnet. So it's really cool, right? 
So the next slide that we're going to look at is a video to show just how these bacteria move. And I brought a prop so you can see. <laughs> so um, what we have next I'm going to show is how they move magnetically. So they're going to swim towards me, and then they're going to swim away from me when I turn it to the north end. And again, they're going to swim towards me when I have the south end, and they're going to stay there because I am no longer moving my magnet. So this video that you're seeing, this video is taken from a microscope slide. So you can video image these at a small scale so you can see their movements. Those tiny circles, those are all the bacteria that contain those magnets, that contain the ability to absorb phosphorus from a water environment. So, I said that they can absorb phosphorus from a water environment. They have the ability to clean up our drinking water supply. Well, how are they going to do this at a large scale? So what we first need to understand is the absorbency properties of these bacteria, what I am actually looking at. But then, how do we do this at a large scale? How do we take all this bacteria out of the water that can absorb phosphorus, and how do we take that phosphorus out of our water? How are we going to do that? Well, here's some options. So you have a large magnet, like the magnet I was holding up, right? So say you have a very large and powerful magnet, and you have that on the back of a boat, a large boat. And you are dragging that through the water somehow. And you have this magnet on the back of the boat, and again, these bacteria live in the sediment. You can easily coax them out of the sediment with a magnet with a north or a south end. So you have a magnet on the back of a boat, and then you can extract the bacteria towards the magnet. They'll swim towards the magnet. They're going to swim towards me on the boat, and you can extract them from the water at a large scale. And there's huge potential for this once we understand the absorbency properties of the bacteria. Secondly, you could even use a trap. So say you have magnets lined in a trap. Think of any trap that you have at home, and you have it lined with magnets that you can attract bacteria to your cage and then therefore have the phosphorus inside the bacteria taken out of the water when you take out the trap. Sounds pretty cool, right? So we have the potential to absorb phosphorus from our water and then take it out. So in the future, where can this lead us to? What exactly does this mean for us? What does this mean for our community? What does this mean for the Toledo algal blooms? What does this mean for the global issue that we have? Well, it's the idea that we are already reducing our inputs of phosphorus. We're trying to limit our agriculture and how much phosphorus they're using. We already have governmental policies in place. So what else can we do? So we're already having the options to reduce the inputs. But this offers a way to actually extract that out, to pull the phosphorus out of our drinking water supply, to take it out of our lakes, take it out of our drinking water supply so we don't have as many issues with harmful algal blooms because we have too much phosphorus. So it's the idea of reducing, reusing, and recycling. We're already taking an action to reduce. We have the potential to reuse this bacteria. How? Well, they're found in our water ecosystem. They're found everywhere in the world almost. So they're already biologically found in our water. Therefore, they don't pose a threat if we introduce them to another ecosystem or if we take them out of the water. They're already biologically there. So we have the potential, once we extract these bacteria from the water, to use them and reuse the phosphorus that is inside of them for agricultural purposes. Because we have already reached peak phosphorus, which means every year there's more and more phosphorus going into our ecosystem, into Lake Erie. And by reusing it, reducing it, and then recycling it back into our ecosystem, we're not going to have as much phosphorus going in. And we're going to be able to take some out to give us our tr clean drinking water supply. So what this idea is, what this research project really is, is the idea to mimic nature. These bacteria have been around for millions and billions of years, and they have perfected the way to absorb phosphorus from a water environment. Simply what we're trying to do is magnify that at a large scale to benefit us, to take the phosphorus out of a water supply and to clean up our drinking water. So this idea is really non-traditional. <laughs> It's kind of out there, but it's a way to think outside the norm and to look at alternatives so we can have a clean drinking water future. So we can have not only reducing our inputs and having science to work on that, but to actually extract it from our water. And it's a start to, start, it's a start to solving our problem, a start to solving 
all these harmful algal blooms that you hear about that contain all those toxins. So you're probably wondering, how do I know all this? <laughs> you know, where is this coming from? Well, I'm an environmental scientist. And I'm really passionate about water science so we can have a clean drinking water future. Because clean drinking water leads to a brighter future. This is a giant that we have that we are trying to tackle. And by together, by looking at all the different alternatives, we have the potential to have a clean drinking water future. Thank you. <laughs>